So within the body, inflammation has a number of different effects. Um, it can induce redness around any point of infection or inflammation. So to, and, and also at the same time, a certain tenderness. So whenever we get an infection or inflammation within the body, we notice that it becomes red and quite tender around that region. That can equally apply to, to things like muscles. If there's uh, inflammation within a muscle, it can become inflamed, it can become tender to the touch, and then also painful to use. And one also tends to see a, a loss of function. So if there's inflammation within a particular organ in the body, it becomes more difficult to use that organ. Um, so for example, within muscles, uh, the muscle becomes weaker. So inflammation also has a number, quite a large number of different effects on the brain. And perhaps one of the most obvious ones, and ones we've known about for many, many years, is that when we get an infection, our body temperature increases. And that is an effect that's governed by an effect of inflammation on the brain. So the hypothalamus, a particular part of the brain that regulates body temperature, um, senses uh, inflammation, uh, proteins induced by the immune system, and resets our body temperature to a slightly higher level. Um, inflammation also has a number of other actions on the brain, for example, the reduction in appetite and the reduction in desire to drink are also um, effects that are controlled to some degree by the brain. So when we become infected and inflamed, um, this inflammation reduces our desire to eat and to drink. But inflammation also has a number of other very interesting effects on our behavior. So for example, when we become inflamed, we typically experience a slight reduction in mood, and perhaps even a degree of irritability. But we also experience things like subjective feelings of fatigue, difficulty concentrating, difficulty focusing, and also um, a slight reduction in our memory performance. Um, other aspects, inflammation can also impair our social behavior. So we tend to isolate ourselves more if we become infected and, and inflamed and don't want to socialize or to perform, I guess, more novelty seeking type behaviors. So these symptoms as a cluster are known as sickness behaviors. And we all experience them whenever we get any type of infection like the flu, for example. So again, I think this is a very interesting question. Um, and currently, I think the answer to that is, is poorly understood. And this is something that we're currently actively looking at. So the question is, if somebody with ME responds differently to an inflammatory challenge to somebody who doesn't have ME? And I think there could be a few different answers to this. And that's what we're currently looking at. But one could be that perhaps people with ME have a more aggressive inflammatory response to an inflammatory challenge in the blood or in the periphery, or it could be that their response is exactly the same as somebody who doesn't have ME. And then the question would arise, well, are there differences within the way their brain processes that inflammatory challenge? So for example, does their brain respond more aggressively or more in a more in a, in a greater manner to an inflammatory challenge than somebody who doesn't have ME. So at the moment, that, that I think that's a very good question. It's something we're looking at. Um, there is no answer at the moment, but hopefully there will be within the next year or two when we, when we look specifically at this question. So do all infections have the same effects um, on the body and on the brain. And again, this is, uh, this is an area of emerging research, but looking at our own research and that of other groups, there do seem to be some differences in the way that, for example, viral infections or bacterial infections or models of these different types of infection affect the brain. Now, it's currently quite unclear why this is the case, but it seems that some of the proteins that are activated by different types of infection may have slightly different effects on the brain. So this is an area that we're currently, again, something we're currently researching, really trying to address our particular parts of the brain more sensitive 
to some types of infection or inflammation um, compared to others. So what is interferon? Um, interferon is, is a cytokine. It's, it's a protein that our bodies naturally produce whenever we, be we become infected, and in particular when we become infected by, vi uh, by viruses. There are a number of different types of interferon, but one that is particularly interesting is interferon alpha, and this is also used therapeutically to help treat patients with chronic hepatitis C. And if it's used in combination with other drugs, can actually cure quite a high percentage of people with chronic hepatitis C. However, what it also does is it induces quite severe cognitive and mood changes when it's given to patients. And perhaps one in four to one in three patients who's given interferon alpha chronically develops depression. So it's very clear that by activating the immune system with interferon, we can induce um, depression, severe fatigue, and a number of other cognitive difficulties in previously relatively healthy individuals. And just on this point, another interesting phenomenon is that these patients who are treated with, severe, uh, with chronic interferon, um, even though their hepatitis C may be cured, there's a percentage of them who go on to experience chronic fatigue and chronic cognitive impairment even after the treatment is over. So again, this is potentially a very good model to use to look at um, um, the long-term effects of activating the immune system. Why is it that symptoms of fatigue and cognitive impairment persist even when the immune activation ceases?